Mixed meter, key changes, six flats and sharps, kick drums and synth beats and oboes and harps. You may think they scare me, you're probably right. Let's do music theory on Halloween night. Halloween, the 1978 movie, fucking slaps, right? You don't need me to tell you that. Written in 10 days, filmed in 20 with like $300,000, and it absolutely wrote the book for everything that would follow it. One of those movies where if you've made it to an adultish level of cultural literacy in a media landscape dominated by US markets without having seen it, you will watch it for the first time and go, oh, that's where that came from the whole damn way through. There's a wealth of fabulous analysis of the film as a whole all over everywhere, including plenty here on youtube.com, but I'd like to focus in on something that, while very widely appreciated, I feel has gotten the short end of the overthinking stick. The main theme. God, what an absolute banger! John Carpenter did not need to go that hard, but he did that for us. So today, in honor of the holiday, let us ponder the question, why is this theme so spooky? And how does it slap so hard? A quick note to returning fans of this channel who know that Halloween is traditionally when I break out the hard-hitting personal stuff, we're not doing that this year. Today is 100% harmless spooky music theory. This is just my Halloween costume. See, I, I have a giant jack-o'-lantern bucket full of cheese balls. And candy corn! What could possibly be less ominous than candy corn? <laughs> I have this problem where every fall I want to eat like exactly three pieces of candy corn and then I just have a pound of it sitting around until Christmas. So if you know nothing else about this piece of music, you probably know that it's in 5-4. If my cursory Google search is any indication, you probably know that even if you don't really know what it means. So let's talk about it. Spoiler alert, we're gonna spend so much time talking about it that that's gonna be pretty much the extent of this particular analysis. There's a lot of interesting stuff to unpack all over and about this piece of music, and I will happily hand that football off to whoever would like to run with it, but this video is gonna be all about that rhythm, baby. 5-4 is a time signature, which is a description of how beats are grouped in a piece of music. In situations where you have people working from a written score, like an orchestra or a choir, this is one of the markings that basically tells the musicians how to read the piece of music in front of them. But you'll still generally hear the same terminology in discussions of genres that don't necessarily start with or rely on written scores, like rock or pop, or synthesizer film scores written and recorded over the course of three days by one guy on record saying he can play just about any keyboard but can't read or write a note. I realized I forgot the spider pillow. We can't have that. It's tradition. So when you hear a term like 5-4, you've got obviously two numbers. The first or top number is the number of beats in a measure. A measure is your smallest unit that repeats regularly, so you want to keep this number on the small side, single digit if possible, usually six or under, but not always. This is the number people are referring to when they say a piece is in number. You may have heard folks refer to the Halloween theme as being in five. The second or bottom number tells you what kind of note you'll see repeated that many times. Most of the time this is either four for quarter notes or eight for eighth notes. Don't panic! These are just two different lengths of notes, NBD. Third grade math, an eighth is half of a quarter, and so an eighth note is half the duration of a quarter note. Now, these aren't objective measures of time, they're relative to the tempo of the piece, so if you're coming at this descriptively rather than working from written sheet music, it's a bit of a judgment call, but rule of thumb, if you could step in time with the music up to and including a brisk walk, it's probably a quarter note. If you'd need to run to keep up, it's probably an eighth note. There is more to it than that, but that's enough of a baseline for us today. Because eighth notes go by so quickly, time signatures with eights on the bottom also usually have some sort of consistent grouping of those eighth note beats into larger pulses. Hallelujah is an example of a pretty classic 6-8 with two groups of three. show Into the Unknown is in a pretty fast 12-8 that mostly gets felt as four groups of three. Into the end. Oh!
This is an interesting example because it's so fast that as far as feeling that pulse or even counting it, it is functionally in four. Those eighth notes rip by at such a clip that you can't even really count them out. But when you feel it in four, each of those beats is very consistently broken down into three subbeats, which is something that can get a little squidgy in written music. The way our system works assumes that as you subdivide, you move by halves. You might have noticed that in the idea of quarter and eighth notes. So if you wanted to write this music down in a time signature with a four on top, you could write it in four four and then write triplets all the way through. That's a way of notating that we're going to fit three equally divided subbeats into a space that would usually take two. But this notation is really meant for occasions where that grouping is the exception, not the rule. If you have to write that over every single beat for the entire piece, it's going to take up a lot of space that really should be saved for all of the other kinds of markings that need to go on the page, and it's just going to end up really busy and confusing. Not optimal. So you could also write a time signature that looks like this, four over a dotted quarter note. A dot adds another 50% of a note's rhythmic value, so a dotted quarter note is equal to one and a half quarter notes, or a quarter note plus an eighth note, or crucially, three eighth notes. Perfect, right? But the problem is, representing that dotted quarter note with a number gets a little messy. The reason why a quarter note is called a quarter note is that it's equal to one quarter of a whole note, and a whole note is a whole measure in 4-4 four, four time. So if you want to come up with a time signature denominator for a situation where the dotted quarter note is the base unit of time, you'd need to represent what fraction of a whole note it takes up, or what fraction of a measure of 4-4 four, four time it takes up, because that's the point of reference everything is built on top of. So a whole note is equal to four quarter notes, and a quarter note is equal to two eighth notes, so that means a whole note is equal to eight eighth notes. And we already established that a dotted quarter note is equal to three eighth notes, so a whole note is going to come out to two and two thirds dotted quarter notes, or eight thirds. Flip the fraction and... Uh... So in general, math being what it is, the simplest way to communicate this time signature with the least amount of excess writing over the course of the rest of the piece is by calling it 12-8. Are there other ways to do it? Absolutely. I haven't seen the original score. It might be notated as four over dotted quarter. That is not even close to unheard of, and a studio musician isn't going to bat an eye at it. But as this conversation moves out of the studio and back off of the written page, 12-8 communicates the same idea with fewer words and less jank. I bring all of this up, despite it having very little to do with John Carpenter, just to kind of remind us what world we're in. Staff notation is a really useful tool for dancing about architecture without having to write a whole dictionary for every new conversation, but it's not a constant of the universe, and there are a lot of things about it that are kind of goofy when you get down to it. Why is it called a quarter note? Well, because it's a quarter of a whole note. So how do we know how big a whole note is? Well, it's equal to four quarter notes. What a circular pile of nonsense! It's incredibly silly! But at the heart of it, it's less arbitrary than it is revealing of bias. The reason the whole system is built on the foundation of four beats per measure is that it's a system that was created to describe music from a tradition that more often than not comes in patterns of four. So just as we move forward, keep that in mind. Music theory is descriptive. It's not a formula, it's not a set of standards for what is and isn't good, it's an exploration of the way that music that was created by people works in the context of other similar music that was created by people. This is not about how John Carpenter's main theme for Halloween uses music theory to scare you. We are using music theory to describe how John Carpenter's main theme for Halloween scares us. So, let's actually talk about John Carpenter's main theme for Halloween. If you're used to hearing a lot of Western music, you probably intuitively expect to hear a number of beats per measure that is a multiple of two, three, or both, whether you know that's what you're expecting or not, because that's what our tradition biases toward. So odd numbers that don't have three as a factor, like five, just sort of feel a little off. 
Not only do they subvert your expectations, they subvert expectations you may not even realize you had in a way you may not be able to put a finger on. If you grew up surrounded by music that came out of this tradition, which you probably did if you grew up in the West, even if you don't have much of a music education, 4-4 is just in your brain, in a very foundational place, somewhere above how to walk and below Hollywood three-act structure. 3-4 three, and 6-8 and 2-2 two, two are invited to the party too, but 5? What the heck is 5? What am I supposed to do with that? It can kind of trip up the team that is the very base, pattern-seeking part of your brain and the slightly less base part that's been conditioned to specifically seek patterns of 3 and 4. It feels a little wrong one might say, spooky. This is where I've heard a lot of analysis of this piece start and end, and to be fair, it's not wrong, and as an acknowledgement within a bigger picture analysis of the whole film, it's doing its job, but as an open and shut description of this piece of music, it is incomplete. I might even go so far as to say woefully so. Plenty of music in five doesn't sound spooky at all. The first movement of Robert Jaeger's Third Suite, for example, is a march with several sections in 5-4, and the only spooky thing about that is if you actually march to it, every other measure, your right foot will land on beat one. Y'all liked my conducting gag, it's only getting more niche from here on out. This channel's for the band geeks now. That march is a great place to start because it's maybe our most conceptually simple version of 5-4. It's just like 4-4 four, four plus one more beat. You start counting, and instead of starting over after 4, you wait until you get to 5. Simple. And there are elements of this going on in the Halloween theme. There's a drum beat keeping the quarter note pulse, like a disco 4 on the floor plus one extra. And that, in and of itself, is a drastically underrated element of spook. I would hardly be the first person to compare a bass or kick drum to a heartbeat, and that effect is really amplified here. By my count, this theme comes in around 140 beats per minute, which would be a pretty elevated heart rate for a person of any age. It feels like your own heart slamming against your rib cage when you're very, very scared, or maybe even running away from something. Not only that, this drum beat isn't totally consistent throughout the piece. It fades in and out. It comes and goes. There are a couple of obvious symbolic readings. Maybe it's the sound of Michael's victims' hearts giving out one at a time. Maybe it's that feeling where you're home alone and the logical part of your brain knows it's unreasonable to jump at every little glimpse of your own reflection, and you can go through periods of mostly convincing yourself that everything really is fine, but then another strange noise comes from somewhere in the vicinity of the back door. But all of this is absolutely kicked up by the fact that this piece is in five. That heartbeat is what keeps us steadily counting, what keeps us grounded in the pattern our brain so desperately wants to seek. So when it fades out, we're left alone in the murky, murky waters of everything else going on here. Because this 4-4 four, four plus 1 situation is not the only way to make 5-4 happen, and it's not the only one John Carpenter is using. Remember how we talked about consistent groupings of eighth notes into larger pulses and time signatures with eight on the bottom? Well, you can do that with X4 time signatures too. Just because the quarter note is your base unit of measurement doesn't actually mean it has to consistently be your pulse. So you can create groups of two or three eighth notes to form a different sort of baseline beat. I learned to mark these in my sheet music as a slash for a group of two or a triangle for a group of three, so that's what I'm going to use for the rest of this video since it's a little more flexibly applicable than staff notation. When these groupings are super consistent and you really get into the groove, they can start to feel very simply like quick beats and slow beats. And when this really works, it can trick you into thinking there are fewer beats than there actually are. 
An anecdote. When I was a kid, my little sister and I took a musical theater dance class together, and that was her first introduction to the dance step the Charleston. And she got kind of obsessed with it. She went through a period where she would just Charleston to absolutely everything. And I remember there was this one day, I came downstairs to the kitchen, and she was doing the weirdest little shuffly dance with this look of just absolute nose-scrunching concentration on her face. And then she stopped, and she looked up at me, and she goes, Laura, have you ever noticed that it's really hard to do the Charleston to Mission Impossible? Count with me. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, this is another beloved film theme that is also in five, or at least the most iconic part of it is. And it's not spooky at all. It is, in fact, so passable for normal that when my high school marching band played it, the trumpet section leader had to get up on the podium to demonstrate how much of a problem it would be to try to march to it by way of explanation for the fact that we were using it for a drum major feature. Or maybe that was just because the director needed some entertainment that day, I don't know. But this can be a pretty common way to approach music in weird time signatures. Do a little math on it until you end up with something more directly comparable to normal. It actually takes an amount of a certain kind of musical knowledge to be able to recognize that the reason it's so hard to do the Charleston or march to this particular piece is that it's in five. Because that slow, slow, quick, quick pulse gets right to the part of your brain that's expecting everything to be in four and says, shh, Shh, everything's fine. Nothing to see here. It's 5 4 wearing a surprisingly good 4 4 disguise. So, are you ready for me to blow your mind? This slow, slow, quick, quick pattern is also the grouping used in the Halloween theme. So why does it feel so much spookier here? To me, the answer comes in the presence of the eighth note subdivision. In the five four parts of Mission Impossible, the attack of each of those slow, slow, quick, quick beat groupings gets overemphasized, with most of the orchestra hitting it together and the eighth pulse kept in one line at a softer dynamic when it's present at all, which helps the changing lengths of those eighth note groupings fly under the radar. It's stealth five. But in Halloween, you hear every eighth note in between, on the same synth and at more or less the same dynamic, every time for the whole piece. It may be the same grouping, but it's using it in the opposite way. Instead of slipping in through the back dressed as a waiter before making its way to the bathroom to change into a tux that looks basically like a tux 4-4 might wear, it's bursting in the front with its big 5-4 chin stuck out and going bonjourno to everyone it meets. Bonjourno. But this subdivision also evokes something else. <laughs> We've talked about situations where subdivisions are grouped very consistently, but they can also change. And the number six mathematically gives a really cool opportunity for that, because you can have three groups of two or two groups of three, and you can swap back and forth between them quite seamlessly. And that's how you can get pieces like America from West Side Story. Now, word of caution, I've seen a lot of analysis slap labels on this rhythmic pattern that aren't quite accurate fits, usually with a bit of an air of trying to lend Latin American cred to a song about the experience of Puerto Rican immigrants written by two white men born in the northeastern United States. So I'm not gonna bother with that today. I'm just going to point out that this pattern of slow, slow, quick, quick, quick is not unique to this song. I first heard it, because I'm a church choir kid, in a hymn called Comfort, Comfort Ye My People, set to a tune written in Europe way back in the mid-1500s. Comfort, comfort ye my people, speak ye peace, thus saith our God. 
Well, almost the same pattern. It does have a few extra beats thrown in here and there, but that's pretty typical of hymns. It makes it easier for a congregation with mixed musical training to sing all in unison. And it's just, it's sort of infectious, right? It wants to be danced to. It's dang delightful, which makes it all the more goddamn infuriating when John Carpenter sets you up for it and then leaves you hanging. In addition to playing on your expectations of 4-4, this piece also plays on your expectations of 6-8, or to give us space for the whole repeating unit, 12-8. You can hear how it should be in 4 and has an extra beat, but you can also hear how it should be in 12 and is missing too. It doesn't matter which pattern your brain latches onto, whether your base of musical knowledge predisposes you to want it to be in 4 or in 12, John Carpenter has thought about you and written to spook you. No matter which expectations you brought to the table, they're going to be subverted. It's going to feel a little bit wrong. It will prime you to be set on edge. No matter how safe you think you are, something can always find its way in. Happy Halloween. Oh hey, another video about music, and we all know what that means. I get to be extra terrified of bad faith copyright claims. Yay! But even if this video ever ends up with sections muted or replaced with weird clap stompy banjo plucking or whatever, you'll always be able to find the definitive version on this video's sponsor, Nebula. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service where some of your favorite educators and commentators can play around with stuff that might not work out on YouTube, like the really excellent anthology series Working Titles, where awesome folks from all corners of the smart internet like Lady Knight the Brave, Polyphon, Uno Dose of Trace, and Medlife Crisis break down the title sequences of their favorite TV shows without having to jump through the kinds of editing hoops that YouTube's deeply unbalanced copyright system requires. Plus, you can find all your favorite creators' full libraries with no ads or sponsor reads, including extended cuts of quite a few of my videos. And we have a Roku app now! It's very exciting! If all that sounds good, which of course it does, why wouldn't it? The best way to sign up is through our bundle with Curiosity Stream, which means you also get Curiosity Stream and their library of thousands of documentary and nonfiction titles. If you like horror icons and musical innovation, which I'm assuming you do if you made it this far into this video, I would highly recommend Dream the Future, a series exploring emergent technology in everyday applications narrated by Sigourney Weaver, including an episode about music that blew my mind so hard it had me yelling at the TV over and over and over again. Normally, a year of Curiosity Stream is just $20, which is already a great deal, but when you sign up using my link down below or by going to curiositystream.com slash laurachrone and using the promo code laurachrone, you'll get an additional 26% off for a total of less than $15 for a whole year and you get Nebula included. And that is a true bundle, not a promo bonus. So you'll keep your Nebula account for no extra charge for as long as you stay a Curiosity Stream subscriber. This is a truly bonkers good deal, and you know, it helps me out, so win-win. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, with an extra special thank you to Andreas Evans, Dylan Lorino, Exceedingly Lizzie, Ilona Kinsetta, Joe Schlesinger, Madeline Capper, Michelle, Nathan Marcotte, Richard Lawson, and Ronnie Rocket. If you'd like to help support this channel directly, you can do that at patreon.com slash laurachrone.